King Edward Mine is around a mile from Camborne, where the world-famous Climax Rock Trillard Engineering Company was founded in 1878. We're very fortunate to have examples of equipment related to the rock drills that were manufactured at Camborne and exported all over the mining world. This is a history of one of those pieces of equipment that we have restored. It is the rock drill sharpener and shanking machine that was made around 1930 and now forms the centerpiece of a display in our boiler room. First, a little history about Climax. The company was founded at Carnbrae in 1878 by Richard Stevens and his son, William Charles, and called R. Stevens and Son. It started as a small workshop for repairing rock drills and soon Richard was making several suggestions and improvements to the machines being repaired that drastically reduced their downtime. Studying the various rock drills that went through his workshop, he became convinced that they could produce a more lasting and faster drilling machine than hitherto been made. And their first rock drill was introduced called the Climax. This machine quickly proved superior in both drilling speed and maintenance that it soon been adopted by many Cornish mines. Modifications and improvements continued and the Climax won many medals at rock drilling competitions and exhibitions. In 1904, the company was offering to fit a water spray device to their rock drills called Peyton Climax Dust Delayer to suppress dust. The company focused all their efforts on supplying only the best rock drills and associated equipment. During 1913, Messrs. R. Stevenson and Son became a private company and adopted the name the Climax Rock Drill and Engineering Works Limited. In 1914, Climax had a workforce of 200 and contributed all out war effort between 1914 and 1917. During the 20s and 30s, the range of pneumatic tools and appliances expanded. Pneumatic tools now include ripping picks, spades and chippers, riveters, paving breakers, pile drivers, plug drills, sand rammers, stone dressing machinery, etc. In 1937, the company was made public and a portable air compressor was introduced. Again, during the Second World War, the company contributed largely to the war effort. Mainly concerned with making armaments, their normal products continue to be made with as much speed as war conditions allowed. And Climax drills and compressors worked in mines all over the world, as well as with the forces on demolition and mine laying. Associated with the war effort was the formation of the Climax Orpheus Male Voice Choir in February 1941 to raise funds for the alleviation of distress caused by air raids on London and Plymouth. The following year, the Climax Work Orchestra was formed and together with the choir, their entertainment supported the war effort. During 1951, the company introduced Maxam pneumatically controlled valves and air cylinders. And in December of that year, Treve and Percy Holman became directors of Climax Rock Drill and Engineering Works. In 1956, Maxam products were being used for low-cost automation of industry at home and abroad. In July 1957, it was announced in the Times that Holman Brothers Limited was now a public company listed on the stock exchange and that about two-thirds of Climax's equity was owned by Holman Brothers. By October, Climax became a wholly owned subsidiary of Holman Brothers Limited. In 1958, Holman acquired the rest of the shares. Max and Power Limited was established as a separate subsidiary company to de develop and exploit its technology for industrial automation. The purpose of a drill sharpener. Drill steels for boring holes in rock were initially made from one piece of steel bar 
with a sharp cutting edge at one end called the drill bit, often slightly larger than the diameter of the drill steel to prevent clogging and collaring as the holes became deeper. Needless to say, these drill bits became blunt and the miner would need several drill steels during his shift underground. At the end of the shift, these would be taken to the blacksmith shop for reshaping and sharpening. With the introduction of pneumatic rock boring machines in the late 1800s and improved shapes for the drill bit, depending on the rock to be drilled and the depth of hole, a big demand was being placed on the blacksmiths to keep up with the supply of well sharpened drill bits. Additionally, the other end of the drill steel was fitted into the rock drilling machines, called a shank, would regularly need to be reshaped. In the early days of rock drills, there was no standard size for the drill steel shanks, with each make a model of rock drill being a different shape and size. In the early 1900s, a further development in drill steels was a hole through the centre for the supply of air to clean the hole and eventually water to suppress dust. This again added to the complexity of the drill steel. Initially, the rock drill manufacturing companies sold the drill steels and a range of blacksmith hands tools, swages and dollies for drill sharpening. This type of drilling machine was a natural development, with drill sharpeners being developed and manufactured by both Holman and Climax. Strictly speaking, the machine was not a sharpener, but a reforging operation where the drill steel end is heated to red hot and clamped by the large diameter piston in the various dies. Held in the first position, the forging ram is driven forward to reform the hot drill bit. Once the head was reformed, a second clamping position offered a piston that drove a needle point through the centre hole to clear it out. The blacksmith would then reheat and quench the drill bit to harden the point. From Climax and Holman catalogues, drill sharpeners seem to have appeared in the early years of the 20th century, late 1920s, to cope with maintaining the crosshead type drill bit with a water feed through the centre of the bit. Information about them is sparse, although, as mentioned, certainly both the Cornish firms of Holman and Climax manufactured them. These sharpeners started to be superseded around World War II when drill steels began to use tungsten carbide bits. They would have been common in mines and quarries, but few now survive. It is understood our machine was acquired from St. Breward Quarry on Bob Memore in 2009 and was manufactured around 1930 by Climax Rock Drill and Engineering Works Limited. Carnbrae Cornwall. The photo shows the drill sharpener uh, in the as received condition. This was subsequently positioned outside the shop at King Edward Mine for a number of years and became a piece of rusty machinery. Restoration of this climax drill sharpener. Work to refurbish the drill sharpener took place over the summer of 2017. Early days for restoration was a general clean down and removal of all the accessory bits. Lots of plus gas, big spanners, and great work by Chris Bereford and Billy Carter. This revealed the main clamping arrangements and large piston cylinder assembly, no doubt requiring even larger spanners and heat to disassemble. Inside the pedestal base appeared to be the main actuation valve for controlling of the clamping cylinder, operated from a lever handle on the outside through a shaft and cams. Removing the grime and dirt from this very rusty relic had started to reveal a number of machine surfaces, some preserved under the grunge and others suffering. In these early days, it started to become clear that to preserve this machine and show it in good order, space needed to be found inside the museum or mill. No doubt in operation, these drill sharpeners would not have been operated outdoors, but most likely in a blacksmith shop. Additionally, as the machine was cleaned down, there appear to be five tool stations on the clamping head, plus the pedal contraption. 
Thanks to information provided by the Dartmoor Kelly Mine Preservation Society, who had restored to working order a similar but bench-type model, it was established that one pneumatic piston was used for reforging the shape of the drill rod ends, and the second cylinder would punch out the center hole. Clearly, there is a guillotine shearing mechanism, plus two further forming stations of unknown purpose. The large diameter master clamping cylinder comprises of one large diameter piston of 17 inches and one smaller diameter slave piston connected together with two three quarter inch and one and a half inch pipes connections to the actuation valve in the pedestal base. An item of concern was the major damage to the underside of the master cylinder casting. As this is on the bottom side of the piston housing, it did not affect the piston operationally as air pressure is only applied to the top. The return stroke is achieved solely with the small slave piston. To maintain rigidity, it appears four sturdy corner straps have been field fitted by a handy blacksmith in the past. The damage is comprised of a large missing piece of the casting, exposing the underside of the piston and a circumferential crack running halfway around the casing. Another point for consideration, certainly in view of this being a static model, should the four somewhat crude corner straps be retained, or should we display as near original as possible? Left in place, these straps could demonstrate the type of field repairs made by blacksmiths to keep things running. Would it ever be a working model? At the time of the restoration, there was no effective air supply in the mill or museum. So it was decided to limit extreme efforts to make everything airtight and functional. However, as components were removed, every effort was made to return them to the best possible working order. One day, there may be a good compressed air system at King Edward Mine, and getting this machine fully operational should not be an enormous task. After some eight weeks of considerable effort and fun by all concerned, using some very big spanners, hammers and heat, the drill sharpener was completely dismantled and all the components moved into the workshop area of the mill. This enabled work to progress without dodging showers. All the small components have been cleaned, refurbished and painted, whilst the machine surfaces, many rusted and pitted, have been cleaned up as far as practically possible and greased. The two rock drill type rams fitted to the back of the machine have been tested on compressed air and appear to function. One is the forging ram to reshape the red hot end of the drill steel and the other is the drill piercing ram to clear the centre water feed hole. Also refurbished and tested on air as far as practicable was the main control valve. Previously, the item of concern was the large crack in the large clamping cylinder housing. Unfortunately, during the disassembling, this component completely came apart along the crack line. We were able to mechanically fix the broken pieces to establish shape and strength for reassembly. Some consideration was given to specialist welding of the casting, but fortunately, the underside of this main cylinder does not see any pressure and is vented to atmosphere. In addition, the four crude corner straps will offer further strength and stability. Cleaning of the big heavy components continued over the next few weeks, and from small areas exposed under layers of dirt and grease, it appeared that the original machine colour was blue. A matching similar colour was used for the repaint, and to highlight, where appropriate, some components in a contrasting colour for the museum exhibit. Instruction on how to operate the drill sharpening sharpener have been received from Kelly Mine Preservation Society, written by an operator of their machine when it was originally at Great Rock Mine. We learned that there would have been a selection of different shaped formers and dollies that would be fitted to accommodate different size and shape drill steels. Looking around the dusty corners and shelves of the mill, 
we have found what looks like three spare formers, very rusty, that may have come with this machine? Present position, the machine has found a home in the vestibule of the boiler house and forms the centerpiece of a small climax display. This includes an early climax air-fed stoper drill, rock drill cradle, plus old climax catalog and photographs. Finally, a little local history, towards the end of the 19th century, Richard Stevens lived in a large house in Riskier called Havelock. And next door but one lived his son, William, in Ensley. Richard is buried in Riskier churchyard with his wife, Jane, William retired to Bournemouth. We hope that you will be able to enjoy a visit to King Edward Mine Museum to see our remarkable former mine. In the meantime, you might also enjoy King Edward Mine's YouTube channel with some videos of our historic working machinery. Thank you to Graham Sull for the research and photographs of the Climax Rock Drill Sharpener. Our presenters were David Ager, Maureen Gilbert, Graham Searle and Tony Bunt. The recording across the internet and production was by Carol Richards in May 2020.